Let's sit in place. President Larry Jensen, Provost John Jackson Jr., staff and student of the Great University of Pennsylvania, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Madam First Lady, sorry for mission. <laughs> Good evening. I bring you warm greetings from Sierra Leone and also sunshine, as you can see. <laughs> I make sure I don't leave it behind all the time when I travel. As we are gathered here today to discuss the future of democracy, progressive politics, and inclusive development in Africa and in Sierra Leone, we find ourselves at a critical juncture in history. Our world faces interconnected crises that challenge the very foundations of our societies. The war in Ukraine has escalated energy and food prices to unprecedented levels igniting a global cost of living crisis that has poured social unrest across various continents. Amid these global upheavals, the demand for food, water and energy is escalating and this is essentially feared by population growth and socioeconomic progress. These global challenges place an immense strain on democracies of nations, Sierra Leone included. Democracies worldwide have been tested as they strive to address this multifaceted crisis, safeguarding the well-being of their citizens while maintaining the principles of freedom equity, and justice. In Sierra Leone, this backdrop of global turmoil intersects with our unique journey towards democracy. Democracy, in essence, is akin to a muscle that requires constant exercise, exercise to remain robust and resilient. Democracy thrives on engagement, transparency, and the rule of law. And like any muscle, if neglected, it risks atrophy, leaving societies vulnerable to the forces of autocracy and despotism. Imagine from the shadows of colonialism and the ravages of an 11-year civil war, Sierra Leone has embarked on a remarkable journey towards a vibrant democracy. Breathing life into the freedoms that form the essence of our national identity. Our democracy's vitality is anchored in its ability to withstand both domestic tribulations and the unprecedented forces of a changing world, compelling us to uphold our foundational principles steadfastly. Our challenges, both global and local, require leadership that is adaptable, transparent, and deeply committed to justice and equality. The inspirational leadership of the late Nelson Mandela demonstrated how progressive politics 
could unite a nation and drive forward social progress. Mandela's international embrace of the Springbok emblem in 1995, in the 1995 Rugby World Champion, emerged as a powerful symbol of unity, showcasing the capacity of visionary leadership to bridge divides and foster collective spirit of hope and resilience. Mandela's enduring influence reminds us all that the essence of progressive polit politics lies beyond mere ideological confines, advocating for governance grounded in values that integrate socioeconomic development, environmental conservation, fairness, and active citizens' engagement. In Sierra Leone, our dedication to these principles is manifested. My involvement in the 1992 military intervention, which aimed to dismantle an entrenched 23-year-old autocracy and pave the way for democratic rule reflects a complex yet necessary chapter in our nation's history. I was also involved in the military palace coup in January 1996 and upheld our promise of returning the country to civilian rule. Subsequently, I organized democratic elections and relinquished power within three months, as has already been stated. This was a testament to my unwavering dedication to the principles of democracy and the rule of law. Such actions, though fraught with challenges, highlight the significance of leadership that prioritizes the collective aspirations of its people over personal ambition. Choosing to relinquish power, especially as a young leader who could have justified holding on to power was not merely a personal decision, but a declaration of my commitment to democratic governance. My role in the peace mediation between the government of Sierra Leone and the revolutionary United Front rebels was not a mere diplomatic endeavor, but a profound commitment to the peace and unity of our nation. This pivotal moment in our history served as a bedrock for the enduring peace we enjoy today, and you mean the honor of being referred to in Sierra Leone today as the father of democracy in Sierra Leone. <laughs> the organization of the first multi-party general elections after two decades marked a significant milestone Transitioning Syria collectively vowed to transcend. We cannot embrace the very practices we have strived to overcome. Africa has indeed come of age. The challenges we face today, be it scarcity of resources, climate change, or the complexities of governing increasingly multicultural and diverse societies demand a governance model that is inclusive, participatory, and adaptive. In Sierra Leone, our commitment to democracy is not merely rhetoric, but is manifested in our actions, policies, and the institutional framework we have established. 
It is a commitment to a future where the will of the people is the cornerstone of governance. We had dialogue supersedes decrees and where the rule of law prevails over the rule by force. My government's abolition of seditious laws, the protection of journalists, journalistic freedom, and the conduct of peaceful elections are milestones that reflect our dedication to building a society where dialogue, transparency, and accountability are the cornerstones of governance. And as we forge ahead, the principles of progressive politics we continue to guide our efforts to create a, a Sierra Leone that is resilient on the face of global challenges, equitable in its distribution of resources, and unwavering in its commitment to democracy. The political and constitutional crises that have beset the ECOWAS subregion in recent years underscore a pressing challenge to the stability and prosperity of our nations. The complicated emergence of unconstitutional governments spawned by a confluence of social discontent, economic hardship, and a crisis of legitimacy poses a grave threat to the democratic fabric we have strived to weave. These challenges call into question the effectiveness of ECOWAS as a regional body and its crucial role as a mediator and guardian of democratic principles. I remain firmly committed to the difficult and necessary task of making sure that this body becomes more relevant and effective in upholding and strengthening democracy. And we call upon all fellow leaders to do the same. In an age where technology and social media have revolutionized the dissemination of information and mobilized citizens to demand transparency and accountability, our resolve to uphold democratic ideas has never been stronger. I must emphasize here that autocratic rule no longer suits our aspirations or the demands of our era. As leaders, our duty is to shape a future rooted in optimism, democracy, and the rich potential of our varied populations, ensuring Africa's sustainable prosperity in a globally interconnected world. A nation's strength is measured not by its wealth alone, but by the distribution of that wealth and the empowerment of its citizens. For Sierra Leone, the pursuit of inclusive development is not just a policy choice. It is a fundamental commitment to ensuring that every Sierra Leonean, regardless of their social, economic, and geographical background, has the opportunity to contribute to and benefit from the nation's growth. Inclusive development directly engages with the principles of participatory democracy, where citizens' engagement and equal opportunities for participation in economic life reinforces the legitimacy and responsiveness of governance structures. My commitment to these ideas is exemplified in the recent enactment of, gen of the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Act 2023, a pivotal <laughs> a pivotal step towards rectifying historical imbalances and championing gender parity by mandating a minimum of 30% quota for women 
in public and private sector the leadership positions, the Act not only aligns with global standards for gender equality, but also acknowledges the indispensable role women play in the development process. This policy is guided, is grounded, sorry, in the understanding that development is most sustainable when it is harnessed, when it harnesses the full potential of its population, recognizing women not just as beneficiaries of development, but as key drivers of change. The relationship between democracy and development, as highlighted by this legislative advance, is symbiotic. A democratic framework that upholds the principles of inclusivity and equality creates an environment conducive for sustainable development. Conversely, development efforts that prioritize inclusivity strengthen democratic institutions by ensuring that they are reflective of and responsive to the needs of the entire population. In Sierra Leone, this reciprocal dynamic is central to our national development strategy as we recognize that our democratic resilience is intrinsically linked to our ability to achieve growth that uplifts every citizen. We need deliberate policy interventions that target structural inequalities and ensure that the dividends of development are equitably shared. This approach not only mitigates the risk of social unrest, but also fosters a sense of belonging and ownership among all stakeholders, thereby enabling social cohesion and national unity. Sierra Leone, like many democracies in the world, is concerned about the unsettling trends of unconstitutional changes of government around the world, but especially in our neighborhood, West Africa. <clears throat> in the context of Sierra Leone, recent attempts to subvert democracy have resulted in significant stress, leading to loss of life and causing shock to the very core of our democratic principles. These events serve as a stark reminder of the fragility of democracy and the importance of safeguarding its against forces that always seek to undermine its integrity. My government is committed to addressing these challenges head on with a relentless focus on restoring societal confidence in democracy and the rule of law. Our mission prioritizes youth engagement in Sierra Leone's democratic and development journey. As a vital demographic, the youth are not mere recipients of progress, but the key architects of our democracy's future. Their dynamism, creativity, and perspectives are essential for fostering innovation and advancement. Through initiatives like the Youth Employment Scheme, which aims to create over 500,000 jobs within the next five years, we are committed to harnessing the potential of our youth, young population. This effort transcends job creation it is a strategic investment in our nation's human capital, 
empowering young Sierra Leoneans to shape a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable future. As we look forward to the future, the challenges we face demand not just resilience, but a renewed commitment to the principles of democracy and development. By grounding our actions in philosophies that prioritize justice, inclusivity, and empowerment, and by placing youth at the center of our democratic and development endeavors, Sierra Leone can navigate the path towards a future that reflects the aspirations of all its citizens. In this digital era, Sierra Leone stands at a transformative juncture for democracy and governance. This era brings unparalleled opportunities for civic engagement and access to information, but also challenges us with the spread of disinformation and the erosion of public discourse. Recognizing these two realities, my government is pioneering, pioneering ambitious technology and infrastructure policies to weave a digital innovation into our national development fabric. These initiatives aim to enhance economic participation and ensure that technological benefits reach every Sierra Leonean, from energy access expansion to digitalization of our financial sector. However, the digital transformation journey introduces obstacles, notably the threat disinformation and hate speech pose to our democratic integrity and unity. In response, we are enhancing digital literacy, supporting fact checking endeavors, and developing legal frameworks to protect free speech while combating misinformation. As we navigate these digital complexities, we are committed to fostering an environment where truth and empathy prevail, prevail in online interactions and recognize the humanity behind every digital footprint. My government seeks partnerships with tech companies and civil society organizations to create a digital ecosystem that reflects democratic values and inclusivity. Our vision for Sierra Leone in the digital era is one of empowerment, democracy, and inclusive growth guided by adoptive governance and a commitment to equity, transparency, and equity. We stand ready to embrace the future, addressing new technology, technology and uplifting us and inviting all stakeholders to contribute to a thriving Sierra Leone in this digital revolution. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen. In the narrative of global development, Africa stands as a pivot across road, not as a continent in need of aid, but as a continent that is in an indispensable partner in the global economy. The era of viewing Africa through the lens of charity must give way to an era of strategic partnerships that recognize that recognize the continent's intrinsic value 
and potential. Africa, with its vast resources, youthful and educate, educated population, and growing middle class, represents the last frontier for investment, a fertile ground for innovation, growth, and shared prosperity. Africa's call is clear. We seek not aid, but equitable partnership with the West, China, Middle East, and all other allies. Our engagement in the global arena must be characterized by mutual respect and shared benefits, ensuring that Africa has a seat at every table where decisions affecting its future are made. And that includes the United Nations Security Council in the permanent category. From trade negotiations to energy equity, climate change dialogues, and the transfer of technological innovations, Africa's voice must be heard and its interests represented. <laughs> the continent's potential is undeniable. Our youthful population is not just the workforce of tomorrow, but a vibrant force ready to drive innovation and economic growth today. Our populace stands ready to contribute and lead in the scientific, technological, and entrepreneurial adventures that we define the future, if harnessed sustainably and equitably. Africa's natural resources offer a path to transformative economic development, not just for Africa, but for the world. And our emerging middle class is a testament to the rising demand for consumer goods, services, and democratic governance. This is the foundation of the aspiring African narrative. A story of a continent on the cusp of progressive transformation. What Africa needs now are strategic partnerships that recognize this potential and are willing to invest in it. Partnerships that go beyond the traditional aid model and focus on creating sustainable economic opportunities that benefit all stakeholders. We forge, as we forge these alliances, let us remember that the future of global stability and prosperity is inextricably linked to Africa's success. By investing in equitable deals, respecting Africa's sovereignty, and fostering an environment of innovation and entrepreneurship, we can collectively ensure that Africa does not rise but soar. Yeah. Our call to action extends beyond our borders, beckoning the African diaspora to contribute their knowledge, skills, and entrepreneurship to the development of their homelands. It is a clear call for Africans to shoulder the responsibility of nation building, to break, from the sh to break free from the shackles of colonialism and dependency, and to forge a meaningful partnership based on shared prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, none of this is possible without peace. This is the task ahead of us all as leaders, but especially for leaders on the continent and in our region. As I conclude, I call 
upon all fellow Sierra Leoneans, African neighbors, and the international community to join us in committing to democratic principles, peace, progressive politics, and inclusive development. Together, let us work towards a future where Sierra Leone and Africa at large can navigate the digital era with resilience, embracing both the challenges and opportunity it, pre it presents for building a more democratic, progressive, and inclusive society. I thank you for your attention and for your belief in the promise of a shared future. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, your lecture. Um, we are the Perry World House, so we might as well start from the global. Mm -hmm. You are the chair of the AU Committee on, of 10 Heads of State and Government on the Reform of UN Security Council, and you spoke to that. Let me play the devil's advocate. Why do you need to reform the United Nations Security Council, and what would Africa gain from such reform? I think the UN Security Council is obsolete. <laughs> Completely obsolete, but also dysfunctional. And uh, instead of helping us deal with the global challenges we have, I think it is compounding the challenges that we have. So it is not just for Africa, but it's an appeal for the world so that we can have a better society. The charter itself is about peace. And from the drama we've seen at the UN Security Council, until and unless there are serious reforms, the world is going to find itself in serious challenges that it cannot easily navigate. Thank you. In recent years, uh, eight successful military coups have uh, replaced democratic governments in West and Central Africa. As a former military ruler yourself, I have two questions about this. The first is that you handed over power within three months. Um, I'm wondering how you accomplished this. Coming from a country where there have been many coups, I know how difficult it is to get the military out of power. So I was wondering how you were able to get, you know, um, to relinquish power within three months. So I would love you to speak more to that. The second part of the question is what do you think can be done? not only to restore democratic rule in these countries, you know, where, uh, which has uh, uh, experienced coups in recent times, but also to prevent, you know, military takeover in the rest of the continent. Uh, dealing with the first part, um, I believe in democracy, as I've stated already. And our intervention was meant to bring about democracy after nearly three decades of autocracy in Sierra Leone, a one-party rule. So in the first place, we intervened because all democratic means to change the government had failed. In fact, a one-party state was in place. So the only way to get rid of it was through unconstitutional means. And how did I get to do it in three months because my value system, I took over with the explicit understanding that I was not going to spend any, not more than three months. My word is my bond. So I took over because I did not want the prolongation of our regime. And um, I did not see myself extending to beyond that point. We, we faced serious challenges at the time because once I made that pronouncement, the rebels that we had been fighting for nearly six, seven years accepted to 
a peace deal, but with the provision that I stayed in power. Yes, that I had to stay in power. But for me, I had already made a commitment to the people of this country, Sierra Leone, and also I was, it would have been totally against my own value system to continue. So um, many see that as difficult, but I didn't see it as difficult. Yes, it was a dangerous move because uh, there are quite a lot of colleagues in the military who did not quite support that. But um, leadership is important, all what is happening today. If the world is in turmoil or distracted, it is because the world lacks leadership. Yes. Leadership is not when things are normal. You show leadership when things are tough. You take the people out of very difficult circumstances. You know, so um, the, the, the leadership I provided at that time was to make sure that we kept our word. I said I will not be here for more than three months. So even, if, even when the rebels said, no, if you stayed longer, we will, we will not fight. I said, no, I have said three months, and come three months, I am going to go. That was how I did it. Coming to the military governments, these are quite different. You remember we had just, these were the early 90s, the Soviet Union had just collapsed. Um, we were a non-aligned state. We are not uh, specifically supported by any of the, of, of the world powers, hegemons. But um, we, we had a situation of um, serious uh, corruption, mismanagement of the economy. Uh, of course, there was no democracy. That was what supported us. Today, what has inspired these other coups cannot be exactly established, and it varies from country to country. So it is difficult to just lump them together and provide a solution for them. I think we have to deal with them um, uh, uh, individually. And um, again, I think um, some of those, or some of us in leadership, who are supposed to protect democracy are the ones actually betraying the cause of democracy. And that in when you tinker with the constitution, using the majority, but you know you're tinkering with the constitution just to stay there. Yes, it is democratic because the majority carries the vote, but you know it is, by princi in principle, it is not. So once the military sees this, and they know that you are manipulating the constitution, this encourages them. And in fact, even the, the opposition, we encourage the military to go there. So most of the coups that take place are actually supported by civilians or encourage because they know that the perpetration of a particular administration will not favor them coming to power through the ballot box. So they will encourage the military. That way they would know that when they, once they encourage the military and the military takes over, then we we'll all put the pressure and an election is held, then they will have a, a, a plain, plain level feed. Thank you. Um, oh, in your first time, you focused a lot on education and gender equality. So I'm wondering how successful you were with these twin policies and uh, what are your uh, priorities for your second term? Education, we, for me, I say is an existential phenomenon. In the world that we live today, education is an imperative. And it's not just uh, ordinary education, education fit for purpose. In Africa, we have to make sure that we catch up with the rest of the world. And to make sure that we do that, we have to educate our population. We have to bring them at par in terms of knowledge, skills. And um, what we did was to, to make sure that access 
was free for every Sierra Indian. Every child born in Sierra Leone has access to um, primary and secondary education at the cost of government. And for women who do STEM courses, they can continue up to university. And um, for the many things that we did, we don't just provide free access to education. We've been working on the quality of education. We have provided also um, to make it easier for the kids, poor people, to be able to send their kids to school, we provide transportation. We are providing school meals, school feeding programs to make sure that kids don't go to school hungry. They can have food in school. We also provide them with core textbooks. Um, our society, there is poverty, and um, some parents cannot provide core textbooks for t kids. So we are providing core textbooks and learning materials for teachers too. So it, it's a combination of a whole host of things. And remember, this, all of this was happening against the backdrop of the many international crises, including COVID that we had. But we kept our focus we have been relentlessly focused on making sure that nothing derails us on this track to education. So we, we, we are definitely recognized by the United Nations Security Council. I co-chaired the um, um, a meeting with uh, summit with the United Nations Sec uh, Secretary General, and I was also part of um, um, the high-level steering committee of UNESCO. And I, I, have been, I am a champion in the world for a foundational education. So besides um, um, learning outcomes, which has greatly improved in Sierra Leone, and the numbers too from both secondary, uh, from secondary school into the universities, and the quality of the results improving in five years we have been, we have received accolades from around the world. And um, uh, this is no mean feat because we did it against very serious constraints financially, but also with international crisis that was, you know, provided a very tough headwind for us. So um, we can't say with a degree of confidence that we did achieve quite a lot, but it's not, it's a long process. We have only started, and we are continuing to make sure that we improve on the quality, make sure that every child gets you know, basic and senior uh, secondary education, and make sure that they can uh, transition to, to university. This time around, um, of course, uh, women's empowerment. I, I always tell my personal story as, as, as the last son of a woman uh, may her soul rest in peace, who had no education at all. And my father died when I was only four. And I started school. I didn't know what to do, nor did my mom know what to do, but she valued education. And through her support and that of my elder sister later on, she also just passed um, about a month, over a month ago. May her soul rest in peace. I... I am where I am today because of education. I come from a little village and um, so many, 100 miles away from the city. So with the support of these women, two women, I was able to get to this point. So I have a strong belief that women have been neglected and that we should bring them at par to their male folks. We, we, we will. We will accelerate the rate of development in the world if we had empowered women as we have done for the centuries just for men. So, I mean, I, I, of course, I may have a, 
I've, I've had a couple of teachers who are men and so on and so forth. But I normally say I'm a product of women. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so um, this is why I believe that um, I, it is not politics. I believe that we should empower them. If we are talking, about, I mean, we pay lip service to development around the world, improvement, if we do not take the women folk along. They have a different take on, on how we see things, and that take is important, their perspective. <laughs> so we, I did not just pay lip service to that. We have... Um, um, moved um, um, an act through parliament called the Gender uh, um, um, Empowerment, which has given, at least in Suradion, the, the basis 30% in all le uh, appointed positions and uh, um, in the private sector and in government, uh, in, in, appoint in um, leadership and many other opportunities that they lacked at the time. So women, are, by legislation, now constitute more than 30% of our legislature, um, cabinet ministers, and every other position. And we, want, we are now in the process of implementation, just to make sure that um, um, we, 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 we bring them along. Yeah. But you did ask about what am I doing this time around. Um, I've realized that, um, I've realized that um, as we are in the middle of all of this education and many things that we did uh, to change the landscape and the narrative of uh, Sierra Leone, um, we had this situation in Ukraine. And we, uh, we have been suffering ever since. Food prices went up. And we have arable land. And what we have decided to do is to, in addition to political independence, have food sovereignty. So we have, this, we have designed a program called Feed Salon. We want to be able to produce most of our own uh, food within the country. And uh, we are just on the cusp of uh, actually implementing that. We are raising the necessary fund, putting the policies and the, every other thing in place to embark successfully on that one. So your main challenger in the June 2023 20, presidential election, the candidate of the APC rejected the results of the elections and uh, he stated that the results were not credible. <coughs> the EU observers also stated you know, that uh, the lack of transparency by the electoral authority led to <coughs> mistrust. Uh, there were also allegations of violence. So how would you react to the criticisms and allegations on the conduct of elections which you, in which you are the, uh, the winner? I, it's only because I didn't want a waste of time. I would have called for a repeat. <laughs> because I know, I know I can beat this man down, hands down, any time. Remember, I beat him in 2018. <laughs> and with all what we have done to change the narrative for Sierra Leone, we have reduced maternal mortality by 61%. <laughs> we have come back to the world stage, you know, uh, to be uh, elected by 198 uh, 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 um, nations around the world to go back to the UN Security Council in a non-permanent category. With all of these, taking all the kids back to school, it, it, is, it is extremely difficult for um, um, an opponent that had no message, <laughs> did not campaign, to claim that uh, he can win. Normally losers don't accept. Yeah, Mr. President, you once told an interviewer in 2011, and I quote you, I'm one of 35 children of Paramount Chief Charlie Voni Bill. In fact, I was 20, 33rd child. That is not the greatest start in life, unquote. You have not done badly, Mr. President. 
So I, apart I, from the two women, what else would you attribute your success to? Um, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I, I, I truly believe that um, 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 uh, besides those two people, may their souls rest in perfect peace. Um, what God has will, no man shall alter. So, whatever the imparted to me, my path to where I am today uh, has been mostly um, crafted and destined by God. I've also, I'm also a hard worker. I'm also a very hard worker. But I truly believe that uh, there are more hardworking people than me. So sometimes I look at the journey and I say, no, I didn't do this alone. And um, um, my mom was not there to take exams for me. My sister was not there to take exams for me. They were not there to, uh, they, they would only encourage me. So that, I think I will distribute the, the word, giving a greater share to God. Now, uh, finally, thank you. Uh, the actor, Idris Elba, uh, is perhaps the biggest celebrity to come out of Sierra Leone. Um, how proud of you, are, of him, are you? And uh, I'm wondering about your relationship. Uh, he was once described as the sex sexiest man alive, I think, <laughs> about 2018. How, so I'm wondering how it feels to be the president of a man who is described as such. I feel sexy when I'm around him. <laughs> Uh, he was he was in Sierra Leone about a month ago, and uh, I, what I admire about him is that he loves his country, and he wants to do to give back to society. So he's working on a project that will help us help the poor people. Uh, he realized that I'm very much interested. I my path, as I've described, uh, is a miraculous one, and um, I, I want to be able to give the same opportunity. Oh, not the same, to give more opportunities to kids, and especially the poor ones and families who, do not, who cannot make it in life if we do not support them. And uh, he, he believes in that uh, too. So uh, he's working on the project to take uh, to Sierra Leone, and um, that is what I like about him mostly. Um, he's a great guy. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll open it up to a few questions. Uh, from the audience uh, now. Uh, can you start from just by your side there? Yeah. Um, is please, it, can you please uh, let us know your name and your affiliation. And yeah. please ask a question. Please do not give a lecture. Right, no problem. <laughs> I'll give you the lecture. Um, <laughs> His Excellency, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Samuel Freeman. I'm a Sierra Leone born. And um, I'm an engineering student and a former student of the Great Bull School. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, thanks for the presentation and the grace for, the, for gracing this time. Um, in the United States, there's a program that provides subsidies for small businesses and for entrepreneurs, and I'm an aspired entrepreneur. So my question is, uh, is that what has your government put in place for young entrepreneurs like me to... Um, What, 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 what provision have you put in place for young entrepreneurs like me who want to make a mobile app that will aid in the health sector? Great, thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. I think we should, do you want to speak? Uh, no, no, the, okay. before I forget the question, so okay. uh, let me just answer. I think um, um, uh, you are definitely um, oh, asking the right question. We've been working on that to make sure that we don't only... One of the reasons why we have a lot of unemployment is because uh, uh, we churn out a lot of graduates, but of course the workspace is not there for them. The government cannot, um, you know, and the, uh, the, the economy has not ex ex expanded uh, at a rate to take in everybody. But if you start your own business, you do not only employ yourself, but you also get to employ more people. And you make money, and the government makes money. 
So what we've been trying to do is not only to teach entrepreneurship, encourage uh, entrepreneurship in un uh, courses in universities, but also to provide the seed money that we get people like you started off. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I, I cannot tell you now where we are on that one, but we had one of our friends in the um, Gulf region that had put about $10 million uh, as seed money for people like you who have great ideas, especially in the area of technology and innovation. So <clears throat> um, we definitely have space and we are thinking about how we can support people like you because we need to make sure that we support you. As you heard from my uh, um, uh, lecture, uh, the youth must be in the center of what we do. They, they, um, um, they constitute nearly 70% of our population. Uh, so even my government has a lot of young people because we are encouraging them to come along. Um, we have to teach them how to lead. And um, if it is a democracy with over 70% of the population being young people, then the young people should be in charge. But wait until I finish. <laughs> yes. Then I will support you. <laughs> then the lady, uh, the lady there? Yes. The lady there? Yes. Okay, give me. Can you just pass it? Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Hajra Jabi. I'm a born Sierra Leonean, and my parents are from the Gambia. And I have many more people in my situation. So how can we obtain a um, Sierra Leonean um, citizenship? <laughs> you start with the ambassador. He's here. <laughs> um, uh, you were born in Sierra Leone, but with G from the Gambia. You are African, <laughs> West African, so it should not be a problem. Yes, um, um, it, we have, you know, we have a lot of Gambians in Sierra Leone, and there are ways of naturalizing. And, huh? Ah, you went to, you went for the diamonds. <laughs> That's where Gambians are always. Okay. Uh, can I, um, I think the the lady at the back, yeah, the lady, yeah, the lady there. The two ladies. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Your Excellency, and also to the provost and all of the directors and everyone here in presence, um, in royal presence, I would say. I acknowledge the work that you have done. I also acknowledge, and while I didn't say my name, I'm Mayor Kashina A. Cross from the city of Glenard in Maryland. I acknowledge the work that you have done and the technology that you have acknowledged in many accords of your presentation tied to a development process that's part of the inclusive development of Africa. One of my number one questions is, is what have you done towards evolving the infrastructure necessary for such said technology to benefit? The education is a pertinent part of it, but also what type of infrastructure. I also introduce my dear husband, Mario Cross. I do introduce G's Victory as well, the Bishop William Lockhart, as well as the Pastor James Johnson, uh, who is here with us. And the green binder, he says, is the answer. But thank you so much for the technology infrastructure question. What have we done to build towards ensuring that we will have a sustainable opportunity? for development? With, with technology and the way it's evolving, I think um, the first is to make sure that we have a strong backbone um, um, infrastructure to ride on. Because what we want to do is to be able to use technology. Like I, I cited an instance of where now we have moved from 30,000 to 100 and nearly 50,000 graduates from um, high school to university, and we cannot, we don't even have the space to accommodate them for, for, for teaching. So we have to have 
um, uh, to use technology to mediate this intervention here, to be able to deliver tuition to them, to, and to also inclusive development, like you said. We have far-flung places, far-to-reach areas of our country. We can only reach them through the fiber optics network that we are still extending. It's quite expensive to develop and, uh, um, uh, a national um, infrastructure for um, a digital inclusion. But uh, we have to do it. We haven't finished, but we are still expanding. And this is why I ask for partnership with tech companies, because it is quite expensive. We want to be able to reach every corner of our country uh, with broadband. That way we can reach every citizen with the services that state has to provide.